Good morning. This is Mike and Corey today on a nice Friday, October 25th. Wow, we've only got a couple more months before the end of 2024. Hard to believe. But um, today's topic is going to talk about inflation when maybe we're not in the middle of inflation, but especially as you hear a lot of promises made on the campaign trail. Going to talk how that feeds into stock buybacks, where that's applied, and then Corey's going to dive into risk-free invest investing. And is anything truly risk-free? Even putting money under your mattress is really not risk-free. But um, before we get started, must remind you this is a financial education presentation. You must do your own due diligence on anything heard in this presentation. More disclaimer information can be found on anchorstarwealth.com and the opinions expressed are mine and Corey's alone. So I'll just start off by saying, you know, I haven't listed a lot of the political promises because that's all they are is promises. And, and, you know, but we hear, you know, we want to give people this and this and this. It's always giving things away. You know, nobody wants to get up and say, I'm going to take things away, but they're going to give things away. And when I hear that, I always think of how are they going to pay for it? Now, it's one thing to pay for something by taking from someone else and giving to someone. That's one way. And there's another way to say, let's print money and give it away, but essentially we're going to take from everybody later on. So these are things that have to do with inflation. So when, when somebody promises something over these next couple of weeks, you know, I just want you to kind of think about this. So I'm going to share my screen because we're going to talk about inflation, and this happened quite a bit in 2022. But there's really two different kinds of inflation, and this comes from investopedia.com, so you can check this out. But there's demand pull infl uh, inflation where basically there's shortages of supply and then there's demand pull inflation where our, our cost push inflation where things are more expensive to produce so you know an example of things there's a shortage of supply i bought a laptop right prior to covid it had a good graphics processor in it a nvidia and it's sitting right here i still use it so it's good enough it's still alive here four years later um and when covid hit there was a supply shortage and one of my kids came and said hey dad you can sell your laptop and make money and i'm like really these things usually you know go down in value and he's like yeah you can make an extra two or three hundred dollars i'm like that's not worth selling my laptop and having to reformat another one but there was an example because it was a shortage of chips and anytime there's a shortage of things you know and there's too many dollars for not enough goods and I thought First Trust, one of our partners, put out a graphic yesterday, and I thought it was very helpful for inflation simplified. So here's the example. You have $10 and 10 apples, and people want to buy apples. How much are they? 10 divided by 10, they're a dollar each. No problem. That makes sense. Another thing was says, well, but what happens if the government takes $2 from the rich and they give two dollars to the poor what what does that do well there's still ten dollars circulating in the economy therefore ten dollars ten apples they're still a dollar each no problem so that does not cause inflation what causes inflation is in, in the second example i'm showing on my screen here is what if what if the federal reserve says we're going to make more money so we're going to increase the money supply by 30 percent now there's instead of $10 in the economy, there's $13. So $13 divided by 10 apples, now they're $1.30 each. So the, the price of the apple went up by 30% just because there's more money. So I thought that was a good, simple example. And then the last one example that they bring up is, is pretty cool is they say, what if the EPA says, hey, there's herbicides that are bad for this kind of bird, so you can't use it anymore, and we can only make five apples. So now we've, we've decreased the supply. So now if there's, and th or there's $13 and there's only five apples that are produced and people want to buy apples, now they're $2.60 per apple. So, wow, inflation affected one, the first one by adding uh, dollars to the economy and the second one by impacting supply. So that's a concept. But now, now let me give you the, the positive side. There's really no positive side to inflation, but of the concept. So 
corporate stock buybacks. And this article came out about a week ago, but this year we're on track for a, a record in 2024 for buying back stock. And, you know, $1.1 trillion. So companies have cash on their book and they can decide or, or they can uh, get cash on their book by issuing bonds or whatever, but then they can buy back their stock. Now, why would they do that? If your stock is highly valued and you think it's where it should be, you probably shouldn't buy it back. But if you believe your stock is undervalued, then this provides a chance to buy back that stock. And as stockholders, there's less supply of the shares, therefore they go up in value, which benefits the stockholder. And a good example of this is Apple. So I'm gonna bring up Apple. This came out earlier this year. I know we mentioned it in their earnings. Um, but in May, they announced they were buying back $110 billion worth of stock. And, and they had raised the repurchases from 90 and 100 billion in previous years. Now, uh, you know, I do want to caveat, this is a budget. This doesn't mean that they do it the next day, they do it when they want to do it. And as holders of Apple stock, which many of us are at Anchor Star Wealth, how does that benefit us? Well. There's less shares out there for other people. Therefore, they must pay more to get them and the stock goes up. Now, I'm not saying this is an absolute direct correlation, but I'm gonna show you the Apple stock since May. And when we look at this, you can see in May, the, the shares were trading around $170 a share. You know, right around 170 to 180. And a lot of us thought that's undervalued. And obviously Apple management did too. And since then, now it's it's also, you know, caused by, you know, releasing their Apple, you know, AI related phones and other things. But stock buybacks is a, certainly a component of this. But now the stock has went from 170, 180 up to $230 a share. So it's went up $50. So that's about 30% uh, in the past six months. So now does stock buybacks always work? No, because if you bought the stock when it's overvalued, uh, you may be wasting money. You may be able to invest that money better in R and D or producing more revenue, things you know, things like that. But in this case, you know, this was a good example of buying back, reducing the supply, which is an inflationary concept, to increase the price, which benefits shareholders. So. Just thought I'd kind of give a basic on that and I will turn it over to Corey and he's gonna talk about risk-free investments. Mike, I do wanna piggyback on that just a little bit. One of my favorite things about a good buyback is, so let's say a company is worth $100 billion and they buy back $5 billion worth of uh, you know, their stock. So they buy back 5 billion worth of shares. And when they do that, they retire the shares. So those shares are no longer on the market. They no longer even exist. They're just mm -hmm. gone. And that's scary for a company because they could have just lit $5 billion on fire if the business gets worse over time. And that $5 billion could be hand, come in handy later. But if it's a great business like what we invest in, um, they'll make that money back over time, right? And then they'll have another $5 billion. But what's really cool about the math is when they've purchased and it retired $5 billion worth of shares, the actual, even if the share price is the exact same, the market cap is now from 100 billion down at 95 billion. So they've actually made the company's value go down, which then, you know, in everyone's valuation models and all that, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, this is This is like now more attractive than we thought, even though the share price could be exactly the same. Um, and sometimes you'll see this, companies will go through, you know, a share price lull, something that we've seen in PayPal, where the business was okay, the stock was broken, but the business was okay. They're buying back as much as 10% of the shares on the market. Um, so then the stock price starts going up. But if you go look at the market cap of the company, so same. the market cap, yeah, the market cap hasn't really moved as much as the stock. So it looks like, whoa, the stock is going crazy, but really the value of the company hasn't moved quite yet. So that's a great way to reward shareholders. All right, and uh, something else to think about as an investor. So kind of leaving 
the um, stock realm, let's go kind of to the yield realm. And stocks do pay dividends and do generate some yield, but they're valued a little different uh, because of the risks associated and uh, the payout ratios. There's a million different reasons why a stock would have a high or low dividend yield. All right, uh, I want to talk about the risk-free rate. So let's think about some other assets, bonds, debt, uh, even derivative assets. These things are priced based around using models based around the risk-free rate of return. And that risk-free rate of return is generally, I mean, it depends where you look. I think of it as the three-month rate the three month uh, treasury bill, because the chances of the government defaulting in the next three months are very low. So it's considered a the risk-free rate. As Mike mentioned, is anything truly risk-free? No, but in terms of how other assets are priced around a risk-free rate, this is where that risk-free rate comes from. So right now, the risk-free rate is 4.6%, uh, so pretty high risk-free rate. Historically speaking, we are rarely higher than this in terms of a risk-free rate. Uh, so that's, that's nice. We want to enjoy that, and we want to recognize that uh, we are benefiting from that right now. A risk-free rate above inflation, comfortably above inflation, that's nice. Um, but there's other things out there. So Maybe there's, um, you know, yeah, bonds, corporate bonds, um, corporate debt, things like that, that generate higher yields than the risk-free rate. And that's that's great. They, they should. Why should they generate a higher yield than the risk-free rate of return? Well, it's because they come with risks, uh, risks greater than the government, you know, chances of defaulting in the next three months. So how do we kind of specifically break that down? In like an equation format, you've got the expected return of the investment. So let's say there's an asset that's going to give you a yield of 10%. So 10% would equal the risk-free rate plus the beta, so how volatile an asset is compared to other similar assets in that market. Um, and then that is times the market risk premium. So a market risk premium. I, I just want to make sure if you're out there and and you're looking at a, an asset uh, generating, you know, high yield bonds, uh, corporate debt, whatever it is, um, even uh, like uh, even stocks really that have high yields too, you just need to be aware that if you're two, three, four, five percent above the risk-free rate, you need to just be aware that there are risks there. The market is telling you there are risks there. Does that mean something bad will happen? Not at all. Uh, it just means that some the market is pricing in that there is a chance something bad could happen. Or maybe not bad, maybe that's not the right word, but something, something with you know, lower returns than maybe what you originally expect. So I just want to make that clear, Mike, and uh, pass it back to you. Awesome. Well, thank you. And everybody have a great weekend and uh, enjoy, enjoy this fall. Have a good one. Bye.